Xi Jinping is celebrating 10 years of Belt and Road infrastructure projects, which is a bit like Eddie Murphy celebrating the anniversary of Pluto Nash. Happy 10th birthday, you money-burning piece of crumbling corrupt trash. Welcome to China Uncensored, I'm Chris Chappell. 2023 is a joyous year. It marks 10 years of China's Belt and Road Initiative, which Chinese officials say is not only fruitful, but also promising. Sure, if by fruitful, the fruit they're talking about is durian, because the whole thing smells like absolute crap. Under Chinese leader Xi Jinping, China has financed more than 3,000 infrastructure projects, everything from ports to power plants, and from high-speed railways to roads, to improve China's transportation links with the rest of the world. As of this recording, China has signed more than 200 BRI agreements with 152 nations and 32 international institutions, which some say are collectively worth around a trillion dollars. To celebrate, China is hosting a forum this week with representatives from more than 130 countries and 30 international organizations, including the Taliban. I'm surprised they don't also have representatives from Snake Mountain and Mordor showing up. Shortly before the forum, China published a white paper titled The Belt and Road Initiative, a key pillar of the global community of shared future. Just rolls off the tongue. It highlighted how, under the BRI framework, China pursues the greater good and shared interests, with the former taking precedence by providing assistance to partner countries within its capabilities and genuinely supporting other developing countries to accelerate development. Chinese state-run media has gushed over the BRI, praising how it boosts economic growth and social progress and brings harmony with nature. The BRI brings harmony with nature the same way milkshakes bring smooth digestion to people that are violently lactose intolerant. If you're worried that China's just using the BRI to gain political influence over other countries, relax. You're just being paranoid. Chinese Foreign Ministry's Director for International Economic Affairs, Li Keqin, said, the Belt and Road transcends the old mindset of geopolitical games and creates a new paradigm of international cooperation. Even Russian leader Vladimir Putin agrees. And he should know. He trusts people as far as he can throw them, which is pretty far when he chucks them screaming out a window. Defenstration, look it up. Да, мы видим, что кто-то воспринимает ее как как попытку Китайской Народной Республики кого-то под себя подмять. Но мы не видим этого. Мы видим просто желание к сотрудничеству. Никто ничего никому не навязывает, не заставляет. Только предоставляются возможности. Вот это, на мой взгляд, то, что отличает предложенный председателем. Китая проект «Один пояс, один путь» от многих других, которые пытаются реализовать в мире страны с тяжелым колониальным наследием. If anyone would know about peace and cooperation, it would definitely be the leader of a nation that's currently waging an invasion in Europe. But that's not colonialism, it's just aggressive redecorating. Of course, the reality of the Belt and Road isn't so rosy. I've shown in previous episodes how Chinese tofu construction is notoriously shoddy both inside of China as well as abroad, all while making countries drown in debt. To further illustrate just how bad China's BRI is, let's look at some examples of Chinese infrastructure gone wrong right after this quick commercial break. Welcome back. China's Belt and Road Initiative is falling apart all around the world. Let's start with Kenya. One of China's biggest projects there is Kenya's Standard Gauge Railway. It's supposed to link the Indian Ocean to inland countries in East Africa, like Uganda, Rwanda, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. On the surface, it looks great. Look how slick and modern it is. Surely this isn't going to wind up like the plot of that Simpsons monorail episode, right? The first section of the railway opened in 2017, but there's a problem. It's supposed to be making a ton of money carrying cargo between inland nations and Kenya's eastern port. The problem is, there is no railway connecting them. Work on the tracks stopped in the middle of the country. Kenya's standard gauge railway continues to be a railway to nowhere. As a result, Kenya's railway system is losing money, even with passenger rides fully booked, all while being left with around $4.7 billion in debt, mainly to Chinese banks. Man, the Simpsons really did predict everything. Malaysia also has a similar problem with its East Coast rail link. It's the most expensive infrastructure project by far for the country. The rail line is supposed to link the East and West coasts of peninsular Malaysia. But it's been bogged down by corruption allegations. 
It was first suspended amid allegations that the former prime minister, Najib Razak, intentionally agreed to Chinese infrastructure at inflated costs in return for a bailout for the infamous state development fund, 1MDB. Both China and Razak denied there was a bailout offer, but classified documents known as the Red Files reveal that China really did corrupt top Malaysian officials into making unfair BRI deals. This is my surprised face. Malaysia later okayed continued work on the railway with an expected cost of $12 billion, but it won't be completed until 2026. That's if it stays on track, which will be hard since China is what would happen if a train wreck became a country. But Malaysia isn't alone. There are other infrastructure projects linked to China that remain unbuilt thanks to their links to corruption. This includes the Korgos Gateway Dry Port, one of China's most ambitious BRI projects in the middle of Kazakhstan. It's supposed to act as a logistical hub for freight transportation between China and Europe. But like many things BRI related, it's a road to nowhere. Ten years on from its birth, the vast investment program seems to be crumbling, halted by bankruptcy and corruption. I'm starting to notice a pattern here. The trade it does carry tends to head west rather than east, favoring Chinese exports to Europe. Although to be fair, that trade gap is a millennia old. Still, it's no wonder why lots of people in Kazakhstan aren't big fans of the BRI. But out of all the BRI countries, none are as in much of a dumpster fire as Laos. China loves pointing out how the U.S. dropped bombs in Laos during the Vietnam War, while China builds railways there. But China has pretty much bombed Laos' entire economy. Of course, China couldn't have done it without the help of Laos' communist leadership. Laos faces a debt crisis after borrowing billions from China. According to Aid Data Research Lab at William & Mary, Laos' total debt to China over an 18-year period, starting in 2000, could be over $12 billion. Now, that might not sound like a lot when we're talking about countries, but for Laos, that's about 65% of its GDP. That would be like if you spend two-thirds of your yearly salary on a new garage, and instead of building it, the contractor left a massive hole in the side of your house and said, you're welcome. According to ADATA's executive director, there is no country in the world with a higher amount of debt exposure to China than Laos. It's a very, very extreme example. Laos went on a borrowing spree and got in over its head. Sounds like a lousy deal. The railway project between Laos and China that's supposed to extend into Thailand, Malaysia, and Singapore is cripplingly expensive. That alone costs the equivalent of a third of Laos' GDP. It's already bad enough that thousands of families were displaced to build the railway, but thanks to Laos' ridiculous debt accumulating spending programs, people are living on the brink. According to the World Bank, the local currency, the Liaoshan Kip, lost 43% of its value against the U.S. dollar this year. Honestly, it might be cheaper for Laos if the U.S. just bombed their railways again. This isn't as big of a flex as you think it is, China. In a country where virtually everything is imported, the statistics translate into sacrifice. Farmers who can no longer afford fertilizer. Children who have dropped out of school to work and families cutting back on health care. Yes, children are dropping out of school. Have you ever seen someone be so bad at their job it affects an entire nation's literacy rates? Laos has so much debt from its hydroelectric dams, trains, highways, and other infrastructure projects that it has given up a lot of its sovereignty. This includes allowing Chinese security agents and police to operate in the country giving up partial control of the electric grid to China and potentially giving a helping hand to China in suppressing dissidents abroad, which many suspect happened to Laos-based activist Chao Xinxin and others like him. To make matters worse, China is pretty much sucking the life out of Laos. Not only is the train between Laos and China favoring Chinese exports, but whatever Laos exports to China is predominantly from Chinese-owned businesses. China's such a bloodsucker, I'm pretty sure the only way Laos can get rid of them at this point is with sunlight and garlic. With the cost for basic necessities like food going up, it's no surprise that there were unprecedented protests in Laos. More Laotians now prefer that their region align with the U.S. rather than China, which has been unheard of for decades. Everything I just listed is just a snippet of just how bad China's BRI actually is, which shouldn't have taken a decade for the world to realize. China knows that there are more and more complaints against its BRI. So what is its solution? Do even more BRI projects. More after the break. Welcome back. China vows that the Belt and Road will ramp up 
despite debt trap criticism and other complaints. Brilliant. That'd be like if Subway's solution to Jared Fogle being outed as a predatory creep was to put him in even more commercials. China's recent BRI white paper says China is ready to increase its resource input in global cooperation and do its best to support and help other developing countries to progress faster. But the problem is China's entire economic system is broken. Continuing the BRI isn't economically sustainable, and the CCP knows it. That's why there's a lot of talk of small is beautiful, a phrase she coined in late 2021. It's China's reboot in an attempt to make lending under the BRI less risky. The mega projects of the past are giving way to smaller, more targeted deals, including in sectors such as green energy and healthcare. China is now increasingly financing projects with small and shorter repayment periods, which sounds like tobacco companies saying they're going to make cigarettes smaller to make the cancer treatments easier. In order to read new interest, China is looking to promote the industrialization and diversification of developing economies. China is also announcing a new maritime cooperation initiative which will go from the South China Sea to the Mediterranean Sea and Africa or as China probably thinks about them, the South China Sea, the West China Sea, and Southwest China. And yet, despite all the problems with BRI, Boston University's Global Development Policy Center says it has largely been a good thing. The center's most recent report lists several significant benefits. These include the increased scale of development in liquidity, finance, economic growth through increased trade, and increased energy financing across the global south, especially in green energy initiatives. It does acknowledge that there are social, environmental, and economic risks, but it argues that the solution is simply to minimize the risks. Okay, so the Global Development Policy Center's answer to BRI is de-risk, don't decouple. That sounds familiar. But if you ask me, any Chinese engagement is a risk. The answer should be no. No to the BRI, no to China, no to TikTok. I know that has nothing to do with what I've been talking about, but it's worth reminding everyone. China is using the BRI to overtake markets and manufacturing capabilities, gain control over key infrastructure, and promote corruption and authoritarianism. If you take all that into consideration, then it becomes clear that there's far more to lose than gain economically from entangling with China. The BRI puts politics over economics, and China's politics are bad for everybody. The moment you offend China over the smallest thing, you'll get punished. Lithuania knows a thing or two about that after China cut its railway trade link with it over Taiwan. In addition, China's economy is collapsing, and it's going to drag everyone tied to it down with it. It's time that people stand up and realize that engaging in any sort of cooperation with China will get their hands dirty and make their people worse off in the long run. And while China says it'll be fruitful, the only fruit I smell wafting off of this is the stench of durian. And if you want to look at how China is taking the world down with its economic policies, then check out this video. And click that orange button to support the show on Patreon. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. See you next time.